Okay, well, thanks everybody for inviting me um, to, to talk about a problem that I'm sure all of us are uh, keenly aware of. Um, I think birders have become very aware of this over the last few decades. And um, you know, it's the problem of birds colliding with buildings. Uh, people outside of the birding community have even started to become aware of this, I think over the last decade. But this is really a problem that was first described here in the United States almost 200 years ago. And since that time, our understanding of why and how birds collide with buildings has grown really kind of slowly. And the slow growth in our understanding has been due mainly to the fact that the two things that are most responsible for causing this problem are things that didn't really become widespread until the latter part of the 20th century. So interesting for us here in the Delaware Valley, um, some of the most important information that was learned about the problem prior to the 1970s actually came from Philadelphia. And this was due to the fact that the study of ornithology in the New World was really centered here in Philadelphia throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. And this is highlighted by names like the Finnish explorer and naturalist Peter Kalm, uh, the English naturalist John and William Bartram, of course, the Scottish ornithologist Alexander Wilson, who we often call the father of American ornithology, and of course, John James Audubon, along with uh, the American naturalist John Casson and Whitmer Stone. And uh, Philadelphia's place as a center for ornithological studies was even further cemented by the formation of the Charles Wilson Peale Museum uh, in 1786. It was called the Philadelphia Museum, but he's, he's the one who created that. And of course, the Academy of Natural Sciences in 1812. So the work conducted by these early naturalists and natural history institutions really led to the discovery of a lot of things in Philadelphia, including a lot of new species of birds, including the barred owl, the blue-headed vireo, the marsh wren, the whippoorwill, the ruby crowned kinglet, the blue gray gnat catcher, cerulean warbler, of course, Philadelphia vireo, uh, Bonaparte's gull, and others. These are all birds that were discovered in the city of Philadelphia. And it also led to some interesting discoveries about bird behavior, including one of the earliest descriptions of a wild bird interacting with glass that was ever documented in the United States. And this interesting anecdote was uh, recently discovered in the archives of the historic Wick House, which is in Germantown section of Philadelphia. And it was discovered by a local researcher named Matt Haley. So according to an entry, in the diary of a Philadelphia resident named Reuben Haynes III uh, that he recorded on October the 30th, 1805, Mr. Haynes described finding a yellow bird in the window at Pennsylvania Hospital, which he subsequently showed to Alexander Wilson. So in describing this observation, uh, here's what he wrote. He said, went with Joseph H. to the Penn Hospital in the garden and greenhouse caught a yellow bird in the window of something we can't, uh, can't really read there, put it in my hat and took it to B. Marshall's, let it fly about the room, took it to Alexander Wilson's after letting the children see it, set it at liberty, stayed to tea. So while this observation confirms to us that wild birds were already interacting with glass during the early part of the 19th century, the first really bona fide report of a bird colliding with glass in the United States didn't actually occur until 1834, when Thomas Nuttall published a report in his Manual of Ornithology of a sharp shin hawk that had crashed through two panes of glass in a greenhouse at the Cambridge Botanic Garden, only to be stopped by a third pane. And then Philadelphia's own John Townsend subsequently described five fatal collisions with glass, all involving yellow-billed cuckoos. And Townsend attributed these collisions, which he described as tragedies, to what he believed to be abnormal, incompetent, and self-destructive behavior on the part of the individual birds involved, and behavior contrary to that of most other birds. But Townsend's conclusion 
that these collisions have been caused by a lack of mental stability really reveals that most people had not yet really recognized that birds could collide with glass simply because of its reflective and transparent qualities. So Philadelphia's position as a center for ornithological studies would also lead to the formation, of course, of the Delaware Valley Ornithological Club in 1890. And uh, during its formative years, the DVOC took a special interest in documenting the migration patterns of birds in the Philadelphia region, as well as the occurrence of birds within the urban core of the city. And that's a topic that they uh, named city ornithology. And having these two interests allow the DVOC to begin documenting the second main reason why birds collide with buildings. And that was the effect of artificial lighting on birds migrating at night. So the first example that appears to have been documented of a bird colliding with a building in Philadelphia because of electric lighting or artificial lighting uh, occurred on August the 28th, 1897 when a soarer was found dead at City Hall Tower. And that was almost two months after the lights on the newly constructed tower had been turned on for the very first time on July 4th of that year. So the person who found the soarer wondered why such a strange bird would come all the way to the tower to die and reported the finding to the, the evening bulletin. And I'm sure most of us, <laughs> on this call know what the evening bulletin uh, was, but just in case anybody may not be familiar with the bulletin, maybe moved here from some other part of the country, it was one of Philadelphia's uh, main newspapers until 1982. So the bulletin actually published a story about the rail and um, this allowed the discovery to come to the attention of the DVOC. And the DVOC subsequently arranged to have uh, the chief electrician at City Hall, a man who was ironically named Mr. Slaughter, to begin monitoring the tower along with uh, adjacent sections of the building uh, for dead and injured birds throughout the spring and fall migratory periods. In addition to collecting the dead and injured birds, Mr. Slaughter and his staff also recorded weather conditions associated with each collision event. And altogether, this work constituted what was probably the first bird collision monitoring study that was ever conducted in North America. So between 1897 and 1899, 527 individual birds involving 56 species were documented colliding with the tower at City Hall, but a whopping 452 of those birds were found during just a nine week period between August 23rd and October 31st of 1899. In a paper that was read before the 17th Congress of the American Ornithologist Union by DVOC founder William Bailey in November of 1899, Mr. Bailey described the collisions that had been documented at City Hall, and he noted that the, unlarge, the, the unusually large number that had been recorded uh, during the fall of 1899 had coincided with the addition of some unusually bright electric lighting that had been placed around the tower temporarily for an event called the Industrial Exhibition. And here are those lights. So this assemblage of lights certainly appears to have been very bright and perhaps brighter than any lights that illuminate uh, this area or that we've ever seen illuminating this area in recent years anyway and uh, of a large number of collision, of the large number of collisions that uh, they had recorded during the time that the lights were present, Mr. Bailey also wrote, and I'm quoting him, special illumination on the tower and several very stormy nights were responsible for the unusual numbers, unquote. So by 1899, the DVOC had already used monitoring to figure out two basic facts about the bird collision problem. First, Artificial light at night can cause nocturnally migrating birds to fly into buildings. And second, this behavior is more likely to occur during periods of stormy weather. So in general, the collisions documented by the DVOC in Philadelphia during the 1890s were some of the earliest observations 
ever made in the U.S. of birds being attracted to artificial light at night that wasn't emanating from a lighthouse. So it's interesting to compare the types and numbers of birds that collided with City Hall Tower during the 1890s with the types and number of birds that collide with buildings in downtown Philadelphia today. While both lists contain a large variety of species, both lists are dominated by warblers. And while the five species found in the largest numbers between 1897 and 1899 included 158 common yellowthroats, 68 northern perulas, 34 yellow rump warblers, 26 palm warblers, and 24 black throated green warblers, the five species found in the largest numbers during a collision monitoring study conducted in downtown Philly from 2008 to 2011 included 106 oven birds, 61 white throated sparrows, 43 common yellow throats, 27 black and white warblers, and 23 northern perulas. Now, there are some similarities between these two lists, uh, but one of the interesting differences is the fact that during the late 1890s, yellow rump warblers collided with the tower in numbers greater than most other species. But in recent years, this species has rarely been recorded colliding with any buildings in the downtown Philly area, despite the fact that during migration, you know, it's really the most numerous um, species of warbler that migrates through our area. Uh, also interesting is the fact that the oven bird and the white-throated sparrow are the species that are recorded colliding with buildings in downtown Philly in the largest numbers today. But only seven oven birds and only one white-throated sparrow were found between 1897 and 1899, despite the fact that monitoring was conducted then during periods when migrating oven birds and white-throated sparrows should have been pre present in pretty significant numbers. So reports from City Hall that were published by the DVOC from 1901 through 1903 indicate that collisions continued to occur there on a regular basis throughout the spring and fall, and several new species were found during this period, including an American robin and a blue jay. And these were considered noteworthy finds at the time because neither species was thought then to migrate at night. But one of the things that bird collision monitoring has demonstrated over the years is that some species that were thought to only migrate during the day can actually migrate at night as well. And some species believed to be non-migratory actually exhibit some migratory behavior. And uh, there will be more about that later. So although the DVOC published reports of bird collisions at City Hall annually from, one, from 1901 through 1903, after 1903, only two additional reports of bird collisions were published, and those reports were published in 1915 and 1948. So the succession of annual reports after 1903 may have been due to the fact that Mr. Slaughter and his staff appear to have ceased their daily monitoring efforts after that year. But in an article that was published in the uh, Philadelphia Ledger newspaper in 1904, Mr. Slaughter was quoted as having said that almost 2,000 birds have been found dead at the tower since 1897, and that of the thousands of birds that passed close to the lights, only a flu actually strike the building. So the DVOC report published in 1915 included details about a major collision event that had occurred at City Hall that year on the night of May 21st and 22nd. And it also included details about a major collision event that occurred later that year on October, October 17th and 18th, as well as a collision event that had occurred a decade earlier on August 28th, 1905. According to the report's author, Delos Culver, the scene on May 22nd was appalling with dead and injured birds lying everywhere on the roof of City Hall around the tower and in the court and walkways below the tower. Although 320 birds were found by Mr. Culver, many others had already been removed from the area by the time he arrived at the scene. And one interesting insight made by this report was the fact that while the largest number of birds continued to collide with City Hall Tower on stormy nights, 
almost none occurred on nights with heavy rain, and at least one collision event that involved 29 birds representing 12 species had occurred on a relatively clear night on which the only contributing weather factor may have been a very light fog that had become evident towards daybreak. Also noted in this report was the fact that while the common yellowthroat and northern perula were still the most numerous collision victims, at least on the night of May 21st and 22nd, 2015, I mean, 1915, sorry about that. Uh, no yellow rump warblers were found that night, despite the fact that, and I'm quoting again, the species was at that time quite common throughout the country. So despite this explanation, um, May 21st is usually a date by which yellow rump warblers um, have all but completed their passage through Philadelphia today, I think. Uh, so this statement might indicate that uh, yellow rump warblers migrated through the Philadelphia area a bit later in the spring uh, 100 years ago than they do today, but um, it's still a little difficult to know for sure whether that's, that's the case. So between 1897 and 1915, no collisions appear to have been reported in Philadelphia from any locations except City Hall which continued to be rather brightly lit throughout this period, although not as festively lit as it had been during the fall of 1899. And no subsequent collision events appear to have been documented in the Philadelphia area after 1915 until 1948, when a major event occurred on the night of September 9th and 10th. So the 1948 event was not only the first collision event to be documented in Philadelphia after 1915, but it was the first time that birds have been documented colliding with any building other than City Hall, according to separate articles that were published by the DVOC and by the Philadelphia Inquirer. On the morning of September 10th, hundreds of dead and dying birds were found around the PSFS Bank building and on its roof and dozens of disoriented birds had also flown inside of City Hall Tower through an open window on the fourth floor. And some of these had made their way up to even higher floors. Construction of the PSFS building had been completed in 1932. And the postcard from that period shown in this slide illustrates how close the PSFS building on the left uh, is located to City Hall which continued to be rather brightly lit at night, even into the 1930s. So the event in 1948 was attributed to a large weather system that had produced fog so widespread and so dense that it grounded planes in a number of cities along the East Coast. In addition to Philadelphia, thousands of migrating birds were also reported to have collided that night with the tallest buildings in New York, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., and Nashville, Tennessee. Quentin Kramer, who wrote the article published by the DVOC, specifically attributed this event to what he called beacon lights at the top of so the tallest buildings in each of these cities, which he believed attracted the birds during the overcast conditions. Mr. Kramer went on to say, and I'm quoting, the birds died due to a rare combination of season, wind, cloud, and man-made illumination, unquote. And he also stated that uncounted numbers of birds have been collected from the roof of the PSFF building and discarded by maintenance workers before they could be examined by the DVOC. But that the club did manage to salvage 206 birds, of which the most numerous species were 59 magnolia warblers, 26, black, uh, 26 American red starts, 23 black and white warblers, 20 oven birds, 15 common yellow throats, 13 black through the blue warblers, and 11 chest and sided warblers. The only birds salvaged that were not warblers were eight red ivirios, two yellow belly flycatchers, and a single scarlet tanager. It's interesting that um, various hypotheses about the birds having died from intense heat emanating from building lights, radioactivity, or even food poisoning were discussed in the Inquirer article, but both articles concluded that in the end, fog and lights were the most likely cause of the tragedy. And uh, while the DVOC article referenced several other events 
in North America in which large numbers of birds had died in a single day from cold or other natural causes, neither the DVOC article or the Inquirer article made reference to any of the collision events that had been previously documented in Philadelphia and why none of the people who had contributed to these articles, including staff from the Philadelphia Zoo, the Academy of Natural Sciences, the DVOC, and other organizations appear to have been aware of the information that had been previously gathered about collisions in Philadelphia is unclear. But this speaks to the fact that prior to the 1970s, there were really few experts that could properly interpret these events from a historical perspective. So during the second half of the 20th century, the collision problem would finally begin to be better understood and recognized in more locations. And this change was due in part to the fact that collisions caused by glass probably began to increase as glass began to be used more and more to cover the facades of new buildings. And it was also due to the pioneering research conducted right here in Southeastern Pennsylvania by Dr. Daniel Clem at Muhlenberg College. Uh, and he started his research in the 1970s. Well, Dr. Clem's research finally provided us with a firm scientific basis for understanding the problem. And Dr. Clem also began to place what we know about collisions in its, in its proper historical perspective. So today, the problem of birds colliding with buildings continues to escalate as the amount of glass and artificial light uh, that birds are exposed to at night continues to increase. And together, these two issues have caused the number of birds that collide with buildings and other types of human structures to be considered a major cause of decline in many species of birds. It's now estimated that 365 million to a billion birds die in the U.S. each year because of collisions with buildings, and similar numbers of birds are estimated to die in other countries each year. And uh, the recent report, uh, which stated that the number of birds in North America had declined by one third since 1970, attributed part of that overall decline to these collisions. In fact, when you look at all the major sources of bird mortality that are caused by humans, uh, bird sliding with buildings is near the top of the list in terms of severity along with predation from domestic cats, which are estimated to actually kill over 2.4 billion birds in the US each year. But some of the cats are capturing birds that have already been injured or stunned because of a collision. So there's some overlap in what they're catching there. So for many years, work to address the bird collision problem in Philadelphia was really only conducted by the Academy of Natural Sciences which continued to add more and more specimens of birds that they'd received that had died through collisions to its research, to its research collection. And that was um, going on all throughout the 1990s. And that further enhanced what we know about the species that were involved, uh, where collisions were occurring, and when they were occurring, and how you know, these collisions, how they varied by sex and age within a species. But in 2006, additional work to address the problem began when the Conservation Department of the Philadelphia Zoo asked Audubon uh, Mid-Atlantic, which was then called Audubon Pennsylvania, uh, and the Academy to collaborate on initiating a Lights Out program in Philadelphia. And Lights Out programs are, of course, programs in which buildings voluntarily turn off external and internal lights at night in order to prevent birds that are migrating at night from flying into the buildings. So that first attempt to bring a lights out program to Philadelphia wasn't successful. And it wasn't successful because the building owners and managers that were asked to participate felt that before they could participate, they needed more information about the nature of the problem at the buildings they owned and operated than was able to be provided for them at the time. So in response to this, Audubon, the zoo, and the academy conducted a formal collision monitoring study at two locations in the downtown Philly area from 2008 through 2011. One location was on the west side of Broad Street, which covers about three and a half square blocks. 
and it included many buildings that were owned and managed by people that had been invited to participate in Lights Out. And the other location, uh, which was about two miles to the Northeast, included the main campus of Temple University. So the red circles and arrows on this map show uh, where these two areas are in relation to each other. So that study uh, produced a lot of really valuable information, um, but it also indicated that at least in the downtown area, collisions were being caused by reflective and transparent glass more than they were being caused by artificial light at night. But that artificial light at night was exacerbating the problems caused by glass by allowing glass to be visible at night. The results, um, along with subsequent monitoring work that's been conducted in the area also showed that birds collide with buildings of all heights, uh, including buildings that are only one or two stories high like the Sister Cities Cafe. So a building's potential for experiencing bird collisions really is determined, at least in downtown Philadelphia, is really determined more by the presence of glass and the influence of artificial light at night than it is by the building's height. During and after the study, birds weren't just documented colliding with buildings, but also with bus shelters and outdoor glass walls, because of course they also contain a lot of reflective and transparent glass. So 75 species of birds were found to have collided with buildings during the study. But as of this year, uh, the number of species that have been recorded colliding with buildings in the downtown area uh, has risen to 118. And that number will certainly continue to grow um, as time goes on. 75% of the birds found during the study were dead and 25% were injured. But we now know that many birds injured by collisions may die later as internal injuries that they sustain cause fatal complications. Most of the serious, injury, most of the serious inj injuries that birds sustain because of a collision appear to be head injuries and those cause brain hemorrhaging and swelling. And this fact was first uh, determined during the early 19th century by the DVOC as they autopsied uh, birds that they had found from collisions. And it's been reconfirmed in recent years by the Academy of Natural Sciences, was also found that the collision victims they're currently processing typically show signs of injuries to the brain or to the skull. So based on the number of individual birds found, uh, we estimated that in the main monitoring area west of Broad Street, up to a thousand collisions were occurring each year. And this estimate factors in collisions that weren't detected because they occurred at times of the day or the year when monitoring wasn't being conducted, as well as collisions that couldn't be detected for other reasons. Uh, monitoring on the main campus of Temple University indicated that birds were also colliding with buildings there at a high rate. And while it remains difficult to really know how many birds collide with buildings annually throughout the entire city of Philadelphia, the number of collisions estimated to occur in the main monitoring area suggests that the citywide total could be quite high. So by occasionally monitoring the subroofs of tall buildings, which is something uh, that's not typically done when collisions are monitored in other cities, it was concluded that at least in downtown Philly, Birds regularly collide with tall buildings at all heights and not mainly on the lowest floors, as a lot of people will tell you. <laughs> so most species appear to have collided with buildings in the main study area in a random uh, pattern, but a few species, including the ruby-throated hummingbird and the black pole warbler, show statistically non-random distributions, suggesting that they were colliding mainly with certain types of buildings or mainly colliding with buildings in certain parts of the study area. And more certainly needs to be learned about how birds interpret the building, the built environment and how they respond to uh, different conditions within the built environment. The red-bellied woodpeckers, tufty tit mice, Carolina wrens, white-breasted nuthatches were recorded colliding with buildings during and after the study 
indicating that some individuals of those species, which are typically considered to be non-migratory, are probably migratory. And more recently, uh, northern cardinals, starlings, house sparrows, hairy woodpeckers, northern mockingbirds, and other species usually considered to be non-migratory in uh, this area have also collided with buildings in downtown Philly, suggesting that some migratory behavior may be occurring in those species as well. So the detached heads and wings of a number of birds were found during the study, and these body parts continue to be found today, indicating that peregrine falcons and other raptors regularly capture birds migrating through the downtown area at night. And these nocturnal predations are made possible by artificial lights that allow the raptors to see birds migrating at night that would otherwise not be visible in the night sky. And this behavior, which also occurs in other cities, was first described in Philadelphia in 1899 in an article about bird collisions at City Hall that was published in the Inquirer. And uh, in recent years, a list of migratory birds captured and eaten by raptors in the downtown area uh, include black-billed cuckoo, yellow-billed cuckoo, yellow-breasted chat, uh, woodcock, northern flicker, eastern meadowlark, and even killdeer. Uh, in addition to birds, several species of bats were and continue to be found at buildings that uh, are being monitored. And this issue uh, <laughs> of bats being at these buildings is not something that we understand very well, um, but it's probably related to migratory behavior and perhaps hibernation. So the species, um, a bird at least, consistently found have collided with buildings in the largest numbers during and after the study include uh, oven bird, white-throated sparrow, uh, yellow-throat, black and white warbler, perula warbler, uh, well, northern perula, magnolia warbler, gray catbird, hermit thrush, ruby-throated hummingbird, dark-eyed junco, and American woodcock. But from year to year, uh, the oven bird has always been found in larger numbers than any, every, any other species. And in fact, oven birds are so prone to uh, land in urban areas with no vegetation, no, tr no trees, no nothing, uh, during migration, I once found one uh, underground in a subway stop. So it had flown down some stairs to two flights and was now walking around the tracks underground at the subway. So uh, unexpected species found during and after the study have included water birds like ducks, sewer birds, and also several species of rails. Uh, but of these unexpected species, I think two of the most amazing finds has included two wild turkeys and a yellow rail, a bird I still have not seen in a while. <laughs> so as mentioned earlier, some species that migrate um, through the Philadelphia area in large numbers and presumably at night are rarely ever found to have collided with buildings in a downtown area today. In addition to yellow warbler, these include yellow warbler, Baltimore Oriole, uh, Eastern Phoebe and Cedar Waxwing. And again, we don't really know why um, this is the case. Although a few starlings and uh, actually a number of house sparrows were found during and after the study, the vast majority of house sparrows, pigeons and starlings that live in the downtown area don't collide with buildings. And I think that demonstrates that birds can learn to avoid collisions with glass, just as our pets do. Uh, as long as they live in areas where they're exposed to glass and other types of reflective and transparent surfaces on a regular basis. So because this study indicated that glass had now become a more significant cause of collisions than artificial light at night, at least in the downtown area, after the study ended in 2011, Audubon and the, and the zoo decided to use the study's results to pursue solutions to the collision problem by placing collision preventing patterns on the windows of collision prone buildings. And these patterns appear as barriers to birds, uh, but they still allow people to see through the windows adequately. So locations where these projects have been completed include the Philadelphia Zoo, John Hines National Wildlife Refuge, the City View Condo, Temple University and the University of Pennsylvania. 
work to raise awareness about the problem and better educate people, at least in um, the Philadelphia area, um, about how the problem can be addressed it has been accomplished in a couple different ways. In 2018, a permanent exhibit about the collision problem was completed at Heinz Refuge and uh, an educational program about how collisions occur on homes and low rise buildings was also created that year. That presentation has subsequently been given to various audiences in the Philadelphia region, as well as to audiences in other locations throughout the country. And uh, that presentation was created and funded by the Wincote Audubon and Lehigh Valley Audubon chapters with assistance from uh, Audubon Mid-Atlantic. And the presentation focus, focuses on homes and low rises because that's where 99% of all collisions with buildings are as, actually estimated to occur. Not high rises, but homes and low rises. So Audubon and the zoo have also um, produced workshops and seminars about the problem. And this and other work to address collisions you know, has gotten a lot of publicity by regional newspapers, magazines, TV, radio, blogs, whatever. And um, these educational efforts have really raised awareness about the problem in the ways that I think have inspired people in the Philadelphia area to begin addressing the problem in more substantial ways over time. In addition to raising awareness and promoting uh, retrofit, retrofits uh, at collision prone buildings, Audubon Mid-Atlantic and the zoo uh, also work with the American Bird Conservancy and local members of the Green Building Council's LEED Building Certification Program to add bird collision prevention to LEED by creating LEED Pilot Credit 55 for bird collision deterrence in 2011. So this is just a pilot credit is voluntary. It's not something that people were mandated to do, but this was the first time that LEED had anything to offer builders to address this particular problem. And it still exists. And um, we don't know how many people have used it. We haven't been able to get any stats from LEED, but we know it's there and it is being used. And um, in a collaborative study that Audubon Mid-Atlantic conducted with the American Bird Conservancy and Fordham University in 2012, uh, we researched the effect that artificial light at night uh, of different colors had on birds actively migrating. Uh, and it was, this was done downtown along the uh, Ben Franklin Parkway. And that study confirmed a result that had previously been observed at offshore oil rigs, specifically that green and blue light can attract nocturnal migrants in significantly lower, significantly lower numbers than white light. And finally, in order to not just talk the talk, but also walk the walk when it comes to this issue, Audubon Mid Atlantic designed a discovery center, which opened in 2018 and the John James Audubon Center, which opened in 2019, to both be buildings that wouldn't experience bird collisions. So rarely are buildings ever constructed from the ground up to be free of the problems that can cause birds to fly into them. And Audubon um, is particularly proud to have created two of a very small number of these types of buildings that have ever been constructed in the United States. So at the Discovery Center, which some of you may have been to, uh, it's located in the Strawberry Mansion section of North Philadelphia. Uh, we use acid etched glass, hanging cords, wooden slats, and vinyl dots uh, to prevent bird collisions. And at the John James Audubon Center in Audubon, PA, perforated vinyl film was installed on most of the windows. And this is the same material that's used to place ads on buses. It allows you to see through it from one side, but it appears completely opaque from the other side. And the windows of the large pavilion that's attached to the center were covered with a clear film that has a pattern of white vertical stripes. So the perforated vinyl film and the white vertical stripes have both been very effective in preventing buildings, preventing collisions at these buildings. So between 2011 and 2020, 
Uh, there's really no significant work done in Philadelphia to monitor for collisions. There was some, but not a lot. But in the fall of 2020, uh, which was during the initial COVID outbreak and shutdown, uh, a member of the DVOC named Steve Maciejewski, who had been a monitor during the original monitoring study a decade earlier, volunteered to monitor the 19th Street uh, monitoring area, which is west of Broad Street. And uh, amazingly, he monitored that area single-handedly seven days a week from, from September 1st through November 30th for a total of 91 days. Because uh, Steve had committed to do this, uh, monitoring throughout the fall season, he just happened to be present on, or he happened to be present on the morning of October 2nd uh, of that year when thousands of nocturnal migrants collided with buildings throughout the area that he was monitoring. And he was able to document that extraordinary event with photos and videos, and also by collecting over 400 of the dead and injured birds. And it's probably safe to say that if Steve hadn't been out monitoring that day, maintenance workers would have simply swept up and, and disposed of all the dead and injured birds. And no one else may have ever known that this extraordinary event had even occurred. So because Steve was present to document the event, um, he also was a person that interested the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer in publishing a story about it. And because the Inquirer did publish a story, um, additional stories about the event were subsequently published by dozens of other news outlets around the world. And this is a photo that Steve took on that day. I mean, it's just, just imagine this multiplied by, you know, 50. <laughs> this, is what, this is what we were seeing all over the place that day. It was pretty horrific. In response to the um, October 2nd event, representatives from the Academy of Natural Sciences, Audubon, Pennsylvania, well, it was Audubon, Pennsylvania then, it's now Audubon, Mid-Atlantic, uh, the DVOC, Valley Forge Audubon, and Woodcote Audubon came together to try to find ways of uh, better protecting birds um, in the area from collisions and reduce the probability of another mass collision event from happening. An outcome of those discussions was the formation of a new collaborative called Bird Safe Philly. So as its first action, Bird Safe Philly wrote an op-ed that was published by the Inquirer, which advocated for a Lights Out program to be created in Philly, because even though most collisions in the downtown area appear to now be caused by glass, artificial light at night continues to cause a percentage of these collisions, and because artificial light, artificial light continues to be the primary cause of mass collisions, which only occur when fog or low cloud ceiling causes large numbers of nocturnal migrants to get disoriented and to fly toward bright lights. Birds Say Philly then initiated um, Philly's first lights out program during the spring of 2021. So the op-ed came out in October, and then the following spring, a Lights Out program actually came into existence. And when the program began, it began with broad participation from members of the Philadelphia business community, including Comcast, Pico, the Philadelphia Building Owners and Managers Association, Brandywine Realty, Liberty Property Trust, and the Building Industry Association. The well, Bird Safe Philly also expanded collision monitoring efforts that have been going on in the downtown area to not just include the traditional monitoring area west of Broad Street, but also an area uh, just west of City Hall and uh, Independence National Historical Park on the east side of the downtown area. Bird Safe Philly also created a page on the popular iNaturalist website where anyone that finds a bird that may have collided with a building in Philadelphia or in the surrounding counties can document that collision allowing us to learn more about the extent of the bird collision problem in the area. And this page complements some other projects on iNaturalist that are designed to document bird collisions at specific locations in Philadelphia, like the University of Pennsylvania Bird Strikes page. And finally, um, Philadelphia City Council also issued a proclamation in support of Lights Out uh, Philly in April of 2021. 
So while birds will continue to collide with buildings, unfortunately, throughout the, this area in the future, I think, I think for the first time ever, a coordinated effort has begun to address the problem in significant ways that will also make it possible for anybody that's interested in the problem to help to do something about it. So while it might take years for the problem, it's caused just by glass to be significantly reduced, the potential for this, I think, is brighter than at any time in the past. And the potential for another mass collision event occurring due to lights has also been reduced thanks to the Lights Out program. So information about all the Bird Safe Philly's work can now be found on the Bird Safe Philly website, which um, also launched last spring. Bird Safe Philly's efforts to monitor uh, in the downtown area for collisions has been made possible by the help of a great group of volunteers who go out from 5.30 till 8 a.m. each morning to search for dead and injured birds when many people are still asleep. And the uh, data from the monitoring work conducted after Lights Out has indicated that Lights Out is probably working. So uh, of course, more data will be needed across additional years to help confirm this result. But uh, the monitoring work has been a very important component of Bird Safe Philly's effort, not only to help assess the effectiveness of Lights Out, but to also provide data that might inspire additional buildings to address collisions by participating in Lights Out or by placing collision preventing patterns on their windows. Bird Safe Philly is particularly indebted to everyone that has volunteered to monitor as well as everyone that has volunteered to transport injured birds found during monitoring to rehab at various uh, rehab clinics in the area. And we're glad to report that the majority of injured birds that were taken to rehab so far uh, were subsequently able to be released. Bird Safe Philly would welcome anyone that might be interested in monitoring or driving birds to rehab or assisting with advocacy work, processing data, or even assisting with management because volunteers are an important part of all bird collision monitoring efforts wherever they are, and they will be essential if the work of Bird Safe Philly is to grow in the future. So to conclude, I'd like to acknowledge the many people and organizations that have made Bird Safe Philly's work possible, and these, in these include the Academy of Natural Sciences, uh, the Delaware Valley Ornithological Club, the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education's Wildlife Rehabilitation Clinic, Valley Forge Audubon, um, and particularly Wincote Audubon, which has provided most of the financial support needed to make Bird Safe Philly's monitoring work possible. Logistical advisory, managerial, technical support has also been provided by a number of volunteers, including some members of the Philadelphia Building Owners and Managers Association, who have been very helpful supporters of both the monitoring program and the Lights Out program. And last but not least, I'd like to recognize the contributions of DVOC member Steve Machievsky, who has volunteered his time to monitor a part of the downtown area seven days a week throughout the spring and fall every year since September of uh, 2020. And Steve's monitoring work, along with the countless interviews he's given and other work he's done to train and manage other monitors and deepen our relationship with uh, building managers, represents really a Herculean, Herculean contribution to the work that Bird Safe Philly has been doing. And we are extremely grateful for that. Um, I estimate that last year, Steve walked 1,280 miles during his monitoring work, which is the distance between Philadelphia and Key West, Florida. And without Steve's dedication and zeal, we probably would never have been aware of the mass collision event that occurred during the fall of 2020, and Bird Safe Philly would never have been created. And uh, we would probably have very little information about what's occurring with bird collisions in the downtown area today. So uh, we are extremely grateful to Steve for, as I, as I like to say, playing the part of Abraham in all this. And uh, like Abraham's descendants, I hope that the results of his work will continue to multiply. So that's it. Um, I would be happy to um, take any questions if anybody has them. Uh, if you'd like me to stop sharing my screen, I will, but I keep this up if you want. <laughs>